Uh, yeah, we can all see that on the screen and on online. So, um, so whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, hey, everybody. Um, nice to meet you, people who are in and people who are on. Um, as you might have noticed, I'm coming with a cane. I'm, I'm visually impaired. So what I'd really like to know is who's in the room. I have some sight, but not enough to make out how gorgeous you all are. So if you can lie, like, tell me anything. <laughs> but some, what, what, it would be really nice to know what is um, your name and, and where, where you come in from today. Um, my name is Tandia Bush, fellow. Um, I've previously been, I'm an author by trade, a novelist, been a filmmaker, and been in the arts. Um, I have a degenerative eye condition, so for me this journey is, has been really interesting from somebody who does not become disabled to then become a disabled activist and academic. It's been really um, both um, exciting and empowering and, and scary, um, but ultimately I would not reverse this. It's, it's actually become quite a gift for me. Um, so yeah, I'll pass it to Stuart and then perhaps if you could just uh, say, say who you are. Yeah. Um, we were both disabled activists, I am um, somebody with cerebral palsy, so um, I can see everybody, but I don't really walk around. Um, <laughs> I walk around and beat people. <laughs> <laughs> so, at okay. so, the time below we do, uh, we are, as I say, disabled activists by trade, and we all work together. We're here today to talk to you guys about the issue of the pandemic, so why should we start? We're in. Yeah, it's Hi there, um, my name is Chris Follows, I'm at the University of Arts London. Hey, I'm Jonathan Keller, Integrated Foundation at Passport. Okay. Can we speak up a bit because of the, the microphone? So. Uh, Julian King from uh, Dublin, Ireland, uh, Institute of Art Design Technology, Program Chair of 3D Design Model Making and Digital Art. Uh, I'm Eva Bao, I'm a lecturer at IADT as well, teaching life drawing and digital skills in animation. <coughs> Um, I'm, I'm Daryl Clifton, I'm the Illustration Program Director at Campbellwell, which is part of the UNL. Hey guys, I'm, I'm Josh, uh, I'm based at the Creative Computing Institute, so part of UAL as well, based in London. Um, I'm with a developer on this project. I'm Mick, I'm a professor uh, at Creative Computing Institute in London. Um, I was a filmmaker, I'm a computer scientist. Um, I've got specs on my head and a black jumper and a bit of a beard. Thank you. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Matt Hawkins. I'm a senior lecturer and integrated practice coordinator on the illustration program uh, at Camberwell. Um, I've got a baseball cap on and a bright coloured shirt. I am Caroline, and I think you know me. <laughs> um, I just want to say that I'm your fan number one. Both of you are wonderful. <laughs> Really, really wonderful. I'm from the Institute of Art Design and Technology in Dublin, in Ireland. Uh, uh, I'm a program co chair on the uh, animation undergraduate program. And uh, I'm wearing a grey jumper, I'm short, ugly, and uh, a <laughs> bad looking white beard. The best beard in the room, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, <laughs> my name is Jenny, Jenny Dunsey, I work here at Bath Spa um, and um, an academic lead for the School of Art and Film Media for this project. Um, we do lots of communication by you guys, so it's great to have you here with us. Um, I'm wearing a navy blue shirt and a cool speaker. Uh, I'm, I'm John, I work here at Bath Spa. Um, my role is a technical demonstration of moving image. Yeah. Um, people will get along. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to say, I have my colleague over on the far side, uh, Debbie, who is um, also both support worker, but in her own right is also a union amazing rep, and so very useful to know in terms of things like accessibility and innovation and inclusion. Great, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, 
So today, uh, in our session, we're hoping to keep it quite informal. Um, we as disabled activists, we are aware that many of you might not engage with disabled people before, or perhaps don't really know the disability cultures and things like that. So um, we are going to keep it quite open. If you feel comfortable sharing, please do. If you don't, that's absolutely fine as well. Um, for those who perhaps weren't at the first session, we had a session a few months back. We're just going to very quickly mean and um, revisit what we mean by accessibility. And then we're going to talk about something called the medical versus the social model of disability. Now, we know that many people might not understand what that is yet, but we'll come on to that in a moment. And finally, we're going to be a little bit controversial in our end point and say that actually accessibility um, is, uh, while, we're, while we're dealing with the unprecedented nature of COVID, what we're going to be arguing is actually to what extent is COVID and the accessibility issues we're facing truly un un unprecedented? Say so actually not. And we'll come on to that in a moment. So, um, just to reiterate our point of disclosure, we will be talking about disability and access and accessibility. So, we always put this in any work that we do. Um, you might feel worried that um, you'd be saying the wrong thing or doing the wrong thing. Um, that's absolutely fine. Um, we have heard everything before, so nothing's going to Brighten us or scare us. Um, this is <laughs> so today is a learning journey for everybody, um, not just in the room but also online as well. Um, and if you do feel uncomfortable in what we're going to be talking about, please just stand back and serve. And we're always here to talk through your anxieties and have any during the break, during the rest of today's session. So um, accessibility then first of all. But very simply, accessibility means finding ways around uh, existing barriers that um, occur in society and allowing everybody to participate without barriers. So we spoke in the first session a few months back about language of accessibility. So in other words, what we mean by accessible language. But accessibility is much broader than that. So um, we include three um, uh, ideas on the rest of the PowerPoint today, which, which are the ones that people typically think of when we think of accessibility. The first one is challenging disabling structures in some form of education, but it doesn't necessarily need to be education. So for instance, inaccessible buildings, and um, how, language, how information is presented, um, how we sort of present ourselves in the room. Um, second one is use of inclusive language and what we mean by that. So again, this is what we will talk about the, in terms of the social model and the medical model in a moment. And finally, accessibility also um, relates to to what extent everybody is included. So we know that accessibility, uh, is, is, while we can do the best job that we can with accessibility, there will potentially be some groups that, for whatever reason, don't feel able to engage or don't or simply can't engage. And so we call this ethics of representation. So um, to begin with, then, we just wanted to give you a very quick warm up session. This will just take a few minutes. And so we'd just like you to think about it in, in much yourselves for a moment, but we've all changed how we communicate in light of COVID. What do you think are the biggest differences for you now compared to the, uh, before the pandemic? And what do you think has worked well and what hasn't worked so well during the pandemic? And the reason why we want you to get, to, get you to think about these things is that they will become relevant when we talk about the unprecedented nature of COVID and what, how we're going to challenge that tomorrow. So, um, as I say, there's no right or wrong answers here. Just take a few moments just to think of what you say. Actually, you might want to write it down. Um, yeah, about three minutes. About three minutes. Yeah. I mean, there's some of the obvious ones, um, but you might have something unusual that change for you. In the way we communicate, can be start with questions. Communicate just generally to anything, anything, anything at all. So, you know, it might be, um, you know, just you know, non-commuting. And you know what that feels like. It could be weight gain. We're not talking about that one, but it could be, you know, anything to do with the general work pattern, um, how you how culturally you feel. Being able to say no to people asking you to go to parties. Mm -hmm. yeah. Able to work from the bedroom. Yeah. <laughs> Um, anyone want to just uh, shout out stuff um, appropriate to this? 
happy to start. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I think one of the biggest changes was um, kind of making a transition into the three D web as a an environment of, of alternative environment, having you know at the start of the pandemic that sort of um, people not liking the sort of Zoom experience basically. And then and then really you know sort of operating in the 3D web on browser, moving around in 3D space and interacting in 3D space on the browser became the default basically yeah. and is still the default now yeah, uh, with a lot of my sort of local community that I work with. And I guess so that's kind of like more direct communication. And then in terms of sort of global communication, I'm, I'm, I'm using Twitter a lot more than I ever did before. I never used my Twitter account before, basically, but maybe occasionally. But I'm literally, you know, Twitter's literally a, a daily, you know, there's, 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 a, there's quite interesting communities now on Twitter that live there. So sure, around digital arts and stuff like that, you know, it's the, it's, it seems to be a place. And then on a personal level, I'd say, Sort of make their own daughter, but I'll, you know, with me being at home a lot more, taking the school every day, you know, that, that sort of our, our sort of communication and relationship is a lot stronger. Too. Okay. So, it's so interesting how we've adjusted exponentially to tech, online tech generally. People you never thought would be able to cope with tech and have said they wouldn't, being forced into it. The learning has been a lot of Yeah. So I, I, um, I think for me the big question is where do I get my joy and my energy from now? Uh, well, now it means from 2020, right? Um, I am someone that really I thrive with students in the room, with faces, with laughter, with. Uh, it, it really makes for me the day. And I think um, I have realized how online I don't get the same energy and I don't get the same balanced person that I am. And so where do I get that from? And I think what I have tried to do is to communicate with my students with a lot of empathy and care. Because I think that we assume that everyone is, and particularly young people, they're digital natives, and you know, they and they know. They are definitely not, and they do struggle a lot. And and so when you say they hope, you know, we people have people that said, "I'm not going to do this." I I think we have to, but it doesn't mean that we want to all the time. And I'm very very wary that this is going to be the, the new normal now, and I don't want that. No, not for me, I don't want it. And I'm going to do something different if that is what I have to do, because I get depleted. And it's nothing, you know, I, I just don't feel that it's meaningful for me. So I'm really wondering, okay, how can I make my communication in a way that I feel it's, it's yeah, it's, it's joyful and for everybody, because I know my students, they also struggle a lot only online option so that, that yeah that I think that's kind of my yeah definitely yeah I would just to continue on with that I've got a list of things here but uh, mm -hmm. one that now at the top of the list is have I met this person there are quite a few times when I've talked to people online and then forgotten whether I've actually met them in the flesh and that's not something that I used to consider uh, and that links into a whole load of other things about expectations uh, about what work is about, uh, about where work is, uh, and what meeting is, and how many meetings is acceptable during the day, but and etc. All that stuff, and all the kind of expectations and associations that we used to have about what's accepted practice, have uh, kind of got thrown in the air. Nobody quite knows what they is. And now, if you have a meeting, to, oh yeah, well they can't join us there online. Right, subject. That sort of thing is all kind of unknown. So it's not a judgmental position, it's just a huge number of unknowns. And I think part of this, need, for me, is if we don't establish kind of etiquette around what it is we think is acceptable, then one will be opposed to one's 
sorry to kind of just jump in in response to this. I think the point's really, as you were saying that, I was just thinking, it occurred to me that almost all of the capacity that I have for a working day is dictated by teams, by one piece of software. Yeah. By what can be fitted into any block of time. That's where the, the, the sort of congestion around meetings seems to have occurred because, because the assumption is that you're constantly in that space. You know, we did quite a lot of work at the beginning of this process to try and develop a kind of etiquette to protect staff more than anything. So we sort of built this document, whether or not we're actually sticking to it, I think the team is another matter. But I think one thing that it feels like it overlaps a little bit with what Nick was saying about the inadequacy of tools. I think we're working with a set of tools in a set of conditions that those two things don't work for one another effectively enough in that regard in terms of um, how we might and better use our time online and also extract ourselves from that time online as well. And the other, sorry if I can just throw one more thing as well, because I've got this, unless you've got you know. Well, the other thing that really struck me is that I think the, the whole engineering of this sort of social interaction has been, we've attempted to replicate it through online tools, but actually the, the interaction is totally different. So there's zero jeopardy in an online encounter in many ways, especially if you're teaching to the board, just looking at the kind of great icon. And, and the, 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 a lot of the work that's done is so sort of tacit in the studio when you're teaching. And you know, what you're picking up on, you know, that old sort of mantra of going to the corners, right? The, the idea that you know, rule number one when you're teaching the studio is you go to the corners of the people who are not presenting themselves to you, who are not, you know, don't feel and you know sufficiently empowered to be able to engage with that moment as well as other students perhaps who are better primed and come from such you know a more privileged environment. You can't do that online because you know for a fact that the corners are just these kind of grey icons, throbbing icons, you've got no idea what's going on in that space. And it's not wanting to intrude, but it's just actually wanting to um, develop a mode a social sort of engagement in the context of education that allows you to do your job and to know something about the experience. I think that for me is one of the, one of the biggest, as we're talking, but it's crystallising a bit better, actually, um, that feels like it's a, you know, we don't have the tools to enable us to do that. I'm not sure whether VR is the right tool either. I mean, that will be interesting to see whether um, that space is going to be the right tool to enable it, or we need to really think about how we support adjusting behaviours. Um, it feels like a big sort of Psychological question, Mark over all of that. Mm. Yeah, um, I'm really sorry, Tamba. I didn't say that I was wearing a black sweater. Oh. I've got hair that's too long for a man my age. You know, sort of <laughs> <gray beard. laughs> You've got hair. It's blonde. I love, I love that. Thank you. <laughs> sorry, can I jump in? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, no. uh, another academic with a beard. <laughs> my top. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think he. To speak yeah. of the digital void, the anxiety of the digital void is something after years of teaching and of a content encounter. This teaching to icons with no response back, this this low level, this low hum of anxiety about, is it, am I being heard? Is there anybody there? Yeah. <laughs> it was so bizarre. And the other thing that happened was I found out, because I have, I have to adapt a, a GoPro as my camera, so the very widescreen kind of view of me, it looked like a Bond villain in my hair. <laughs> But I had to, um, I started getting more gestural. I started using hand signals more, thumbs up and all this kind of stuff. Nobody else does it, but I myself doing it, which I thought was kind of interesting. It's really interesting, yeah. absolutely, the processes that we're developing. So yes, yeah, so I think what we, you know, the, con the consensus is that, you know, the, the way that we're working at the moment has opened a lot of flexibility, but at the same time, that flexibility can actually become at the cost of failing. Yes. Um, and this is exactly the point that we're trying to get across today. And we will talk about this when we come on to the, uh, the third part of our talk. Um, but given that we've just spoken about the experiences, um, we would like you to just think about for a moment uh, about applying it to what we call the social versus the medical model. Now, this is what we said at the start. We understand that probably 90% of you might not have heard of the medical model or the social model, and that's absolutely fine. Um, but obviously, Tambi and I come from um, activist backgrounds, and this is something that has originated in activist um, academic work. Um, but to put it very simply, there are two strands of thinking in relation to uh, disability and inclusion in society. There is the medical model, and there is the social model. 
So the medical model <laughs> assumes that disabled people, or indeed any person that is um, underrepresented, is at fault for any challenge or barrier that we face in society. So we'll come on to some examples in just a moment. Whereas the social model um, is the opposite of that. So it assumes that actually any barrier that we all encounter as people are socially constructed. And so that if we remove those barriers, we can help everybody participate in an inclusive way. And the reason why we talk about the medical versus the social model is because naturally, I would assume the majority of people would think they would endorse the social model. Um, but we know the medical model is still very much part of everyday discourse, certainly within education, but also um, in society more generally. So we've included some example quotes that Tammy and I encounter a lot. Um, so, uh, again, by no means exhaustive, it's just to, make, just to get you to think about how it can play out in practice, often in very subtle ways. So, for instance, in relation to group work, a very common statement that we often see is somebody is not working hard enough, or that person isn't doing as much as me, or I don't feel that one, that, that person is, is putting the same amount of work in as everybody else is. Um, the, the short answer is we don't know. You know, that, that could be a true to life narrative, but it could also there could be lots of other reasons as to why that person is not perceived to be working as hard as, as someone. Second one is a, is a very common one the building is old, we can't put around it. So, this is very, very common in academia. We know it happens well, on a more than daily basis for, for, for me, from my experience. Now, while we understand the validity of old buildings and it's going to be very expensive to change old buildings. What is basically being presented here is that the cost of changing a building is put at the disabled person's door. So what it's effectively saying is we can't justify that expense because you're, it's only for you. Um, but actually we need to reframe that and say actually if you put a ramp in or make a building accessible for everybody, it's going to be accessible for everybody. Which is what the social model is saying. And finally a very common one for, for second, um, pandemic work is wanting to go back to the old normal. So while we keep talking about going to a new normal, it's very common in certainly government discourse to say we want to go back to what it was like before. So we know that you know, there are obviously very real restrictions for many people at the moment, but there are some really positive learning that we can all take forward. So by wanting to go back to an old normal, it's effectively saying the old ways of working were the best ways. Um, it's disregarding the fact that many people were excluded on a day to day basis. So, so we, just, just to put that in context, the um, UN declared what was going on in, in UK in terms of disability um, and austerity, a human catastrophe in 2018, 2019. Some of you are aware of that, and um, we've got, you know, government ignored it. Um, they just put forward a disability strategy, which has been proved unlawful because they, you know, so the, the, we, don't, we, don't, we can't go back to the new normal, the, to, to the old. We can't go back. It's dangerous for, for, for all of us. Um, as we'll come on to later. The, the reason why we speak, we speak about the medical model and the social model is that while it originated in disabled people's circles, um, came from uh, disabled academics, disabled activists of the late 1960s, early 70s, um, it's more general than that because um, really when you think about what disability is, we can't just be disabled people. Disability is the only identity that intersects every other identity that we know of. So, for instance, disabled women, disabled people of colour, disabled people wanting to raise LGBTQ+, um, whereas you, you can be, for instance, a woman without a disability, you can't be a disabled person without something. So, we argue that actually if you, if you think about the social model as something that affects everybody, we can start to begin to understand that we all experience a collective societal barrier, not just in accessibility, but just in how we communicate and how we engage with the world on a day-to-day -day basis. So barriers in society prevent us all from participating in an equal way. We often don't even realise that we're being excluded in, in many circles. But all of us, I can guarantee every single one of us in this room has been excluded in some way that we thought that we are the problem and actually we're not. So at this point, we would like to take just another period of time just to reflect for a moment on how what the social model might have applied to your life at some point. It could be today, it could be a previous experience. So, and, and given your own experience, how might the social model shape your thinking going forward? So, we want you to think about any previous uh, example, uh, for instance, where you have felt personally blamed, or you have 
possibly be victimised and actually you can start to think, was it me that was the problem? Was I at fault here? Was there something else that I could have done? Um, because this is really frame, reframing that sort of medicalised thinking into a social one. We know it's very difficult for many people who haven't engaged with it before, but I'm 90% sure that everybody with enough thinking could probably think of at least one example they've had in their lives. And obviously it's very personal, so if you don't want to share, that's absolutely fine. Please just keep it to yourself. Does that make sense? Because if you, yeah. do you want us to run through that again? I think so, I'm not sure, but we'll see. It could, it could be something to do, you know, poverty. Uh, poverty is a barrier for a lot of people. Class can be a barrier. Being pregnant. Uh, I was thinking about barrier. that one. Yeah. Having toddlers and trying to get on a bus. You're as disabled as anybody who can tell you two toddlers. And if you have three. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. And, and who, but who's to blame? You know, in, in those situations, who are the people on the bus looking at? Is there... So it's those kinds of things, you know, within, within your work, if, somebody, if you're blocked by tech, some kind of tech, um, are we blocked by our funders? Are we blocked, you know, is it, is it a societal, is it a cultural thing? There's, I mean, at every level, you'll find something. People without the right beard shampoo. I don't know. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sam. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to diverge a bit. So I grew up in Venezuela, in Latin America. Um, and I... I'm hesitant to say it, but I think it is true. Disability is not even considered. It doesn't exist. Um, so I have, I have three children, already big and old. Um, and one of them has a really, really, really strong attention deficit disorder. Very, very strong with a big uh, comorbidity. And there was no school where you could say, you know, there is a problem here. He has a problem. So for him, the blackboard doesn't make, he doesn't know if it starts from here to here, from here to here, from here. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense to them. And there was no way that I could find any special help for someone with that huge disability. And so when I'm here, and I see what you say is unlawful and that it doesn't work. I breathe and I say, oh my God, you know, again, my beliefs are challenged because I do think there is so much in place. But then I then say, okay, let's move back and let's just put myself in here with the reality of someone that has those inconvenience or problems. And yes, there is nothing wrong. And yes, there are problems. And if I go on a bus and I see someone, there's no around, you know, you name it. But then I guess where I, it, it's, it's the perspective and it's how I was raised with nothing whatsoever. It's, it's, it doesn't exist. So you kind of think, wow, that is kind of, I just wanted to put that out. It's so important that that particular view as well, because the whole thing of this kind of uh, make do that affects, you know, not culturally, uh, people in the older generation they do not, when they become disabled, they will not ask for help. You know, they do not know their rights. Most of us do not know our rights, you know. And, and so we're, we're expected to, to be, uh, um, you've got so much, I'll be quiet. You're not actually equal people. You're expect, you're, you get to this point, and then they're well done. We've done that for you. Look at the rest of the world. Look at Venezuela. I grew up in Zambia, you know, there's, again, lots of fear around certainly certain conditions. Um, so, you know, that's enough. Be, be thankful, be grateful, yeah. but it doesn't, but it still discards the fact that it's 20, it's actually, every, we'll all be disabled at some point, every single one of us. And working disabled, active disabled people, that's 20% of the population, wherever you are. As Stuart said, you can, you know, it doesn't matter, you could 
you know, be an Arsenal supporter, you'll know there will be disabled people within that. You could be working on a, on a lorry fleet in Zanzibar, disabled people. It's the only thing that interconnects every single other part of humanity, and yet it's the one thing we out. It's crazy. So, I mean, it's so weird, isn't it? When you think about it, this is, this is about our, 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 huma, our humanness. And, and there we are putting it outside. Tell me, it's, it's also difficult to connect with it as a, as in a human level because it, it, it saddens you in a way, in a good way. I mean, the sadness, the melancholy, the, the, yeah. the you know, this, this, um, you know, all the, all the human aspect that you really don't want to deal with, or it's difficult for humans to deal with, and we're not culturally also in that space of this is what's happening and let's deal with it. And, and, and so I think it's also it serves that purpose of. Everything is, you know, super shiny, drain, and, yeah. and that's where inspiration form comes in, which we'll probably get onto. I'll jump ahead, but yes. Sorry, so we went into a different tack. Do you want to bring it back? To what, well, anyone I, I, else? Yeah, I was going to say it's important, actually. You know, Caroline said something really powerful yeah. about sort of, um, uh, you know, we don't like to talk about disability, but that is a, a classic example of a medical model. It's something that we we burden disabled people, so we just don't talk about it. It's you know, they are a problem. Yes, they have. Right from the way, we don't need to think or do anything about it. So this is, yeah, shows how much it's embedded. Just to add a minor point to that, I mean, it's, it's a big point, but it's, it doesn't need a lot to think about, which is about categories. I mean, you touched on it then in the sense that we all will be disabled at some stage. And then what dis disablement means, because it's, it's, uh, it's, it's unclear, and, we, and people mean different things by it. So this kind of strength and uh, difficulty of language is that it makes lots of things possible through like being able to identify them. But as soon as it does that, you have a kind of soft wall around uh, elements like intelligence, disability, academic ability, the grading process of, of, of standard education, and stuff like that, which which all have a, have huge social effects on people from different strata who've got different starting points and all the rest of it. Uh, and that's a massive area, but but the category is the what was Yeah, yeah. Just really, I mean, we're, it's, a, we're still a work in progress, mm -hmm. continuous work in progress, which is worrying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you, everybody. You know, it was you know probably quite a, a strange topic to talk about if it's, if it's new to you and we, we we understand that really really and truly um, but the reason why we want you to think about it in this way is that we want to move on to the sort of the final 15 10 15 minutes sort of the talk that we're going to share today we want you to really think about for a moment is the COVID pandemic really as unprecedented as people say it is because when we think about the medical model versus the social model um, we want to understand that while the pandemic has undoubtedly been a very novel and challenging time for education, in that we've all had to adapt to new and interesting barriers that many of us haven't encountered before, we can't forget that any person who is uh, disadvantaged in society, so disabled people or any other group, we all experience crises of accessibility on a day-to-day -day basis, often without us even realising. It's just disabled people are often much more visible and understand the, the barriers that we all face. So, crucially, the reason why Tammy and I we, we do talk about accessibility from a disability studies perspective is that disabled people who are deaf, who experience accessibility crisis on a day to day basis, adapting to these challenges is not new to us. We have to do it every single day of our lives, multiple times a day. Tammy and I have done it this morning already. Yeah. <laughs> so, and we will do it you know, many other times during the day. So what we want to argue is that viewing COVID as truly unprecedented is actually a very medical model because undermining the knowledge and the, the beauty and the experience that disabled people have um, do we all have in responding to crises because it's basically saying this is a unique event, it's never happened before, so none of us can really what's going on. So it's undermining all of our lived experience, all of our lived knowledge um, in terms of how we move forward and um, because I can Maybe we haven't thought about it, but I imagine if, every, if everybody in the room were to think about the pandemic for a moment, I'm sure we would possibly think 
there's something that is new to us, but there's actually something that I perhaps wanted to do, or, uh, or there's something that I think perhaps could have been done better from my own experience or something. You know, when we give it a chance to, to really reflect and digest what the COVID pandemic is, we can all start to think, actually, I bring some knowledge here that perhaps I didn't otherwise think I had. So, I mean, I can clarify a little bit. With, with a lot of people who with disabilities, um, disabled people were already, the only access they had was online for some people. So obviously a lot of people couldn't get online. So they, so for instance, a lot of disabled people were actively looking for work that they could do flexibly working from home and were disallowed. There's a whole, we've been actually calling for it for years and years and years. We knew it was possible, but employers had said no. Now we all know within a, a week, we could all do it. So you see that, that we, and that people who've been shielding, people who have um, been living with um, mask wearing, uh, living with anxiety and isolation, all of that um, incredible wealth of knowledge was not called on. And, you know, people now becoming, getting long COVID, I and mean, you've got a lot of people who have MS or have ME who are also able to take part in these conversations and support and help. You know, this whole resource has been there and completely unused and, and unseen, deliberately unseen, because it, 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 it's for some reason that people think it's going to be more expensive when actually Obviously, if you do the maths, you do the economics, it's actually a lot less expensive to give everyone, give the reasonable adjustments and get people working. And to get all this incredible, diverse life force into your, uh, into your communities. So, thank you, Tampi. Um, as, as we've sort of just alluded to, we wanted to give you some examples just to really crystallise what we've um, just said. So, so obviously, Tampi was talking about online learning already in that um, we wanted to talk about just some example um, crises that we're all experiencing in terms of the, the online learning versus the blended learning issues with how we navigate social distancing and concerns about virus spreading but also issues that we're all encountering at the moment in terms of fatigue, uh, we've reduced well-being, people feeling isolated, if we are stuck inside due to lockdown that's quite a, a difficult place for us all to be in. Um, we might be experiencing fatigue, as, as Tammy was saying, long COVID, poor mental health, that kind of thing. But to address this point in more detail, we want to really reframe that for a moment and say, actually, none of these examples that we've just spoken about are new in the sense that, because Tammy's already said just a moment ago, disabled people have been requesting flexible working and learning options for literally decades, literally decades, certainly before the millennium, um, in that. Every single time we've been asking for them, and we've been told it's too expensive, it's not, it's not needed, it's, you know, it's, it's just an unnecessary burden. In terms of the personal, um, sorry, the spread of the virus and, and things like that, we know that disabled people are routinely denied personal space. So, for instance, people that use wheelchairs, um, it's very common for, for members of the public to intervene and push. And obviously, as any person with a wheelchair will say, the wheelchair is part of them. You're not coming in my space. Um, I, I once got um, picked up and put on a train. I had my cane and somebody came up behind me and actually put me on the train. Luckily it was the right train, so <laughs> they didn't say anything, they just thought like, I was luggage. It's bizarre. It's like, oh my God. It's, a, it's, a, it's a really good example. Um, and so many people who were immunocompromised, so we, we know at the moment it's, it's a really um, scary time for people who are immunocompromised because of all the um, security measures that uh, we're in place and now being lifted this week. Um, we've not just had to be aware of, of COVID, we've had to be aware of any other virus that's gone before and any other virus that will come again. And the lockdown effects that I, could, that I just mentioned on the previous slide, they are a routine experience for disabled people. And if we can't participate in equitable ways, we, we are going to experience you know, low um, mental health, frustration about being able to now, being unable to navigate in accessible buildings, um, you know, being unable to access doors, all of these things that not as disabled people are feeling in terms of frustration about being locked inside, these are some things that we encounter on a day to day basis. So you can begin to see that actually all of these individual problems that we're blaming as individual problems aren't individual problems at all, but much bigger systemic issues that aren't being talked about in the way that they should be. Um, so, 
So given that we've tried to reframe that narrative in the way that we have, we want to come back to full circle in terms of what we said at the start, in terms of how the pandemic or whether the pandemic has actually highlighted existing challenges or created new challenges, in that we would want to change, change that narrative a little bit by saying that while the pandemic has undoubtedly brought new challenges and new changes to the world, what we're not really talking about is it's revealed and exacerbated many, many, many challenges that have long been um, and they're all coming to the fore now. So things in relation to education that we're now beginning to think about is why is inclusive and accessible education important? It's not just something for disabled well, people, it's beneficial for everybody. Who is worthy? Who is, who is a burden? Who is challenging in education? And whose voices are being heard in education? Because we, as we know, we've said already that disabled well, people's voices aren't being heard in education. And this is partly explains some of the issues we've been encountering in the way that we have. So we want to sort of end this bit by saying the new challenge for all of us, if there is a new challenge, is how we embed the changes we've developed. Because we don't embed the changes that we've developed, we'll all revert back to the old normal, which is obviously something that we said we really don't want to go back to, because we know how unhealthy we can be. But also, it's, it's actually dangerous for us. When, when, when COVID started, um, and they were refusing ventilators to people with certain conditions. Um, had Stuart or I potentially gone in in a coma, um, there's no, we wouldn't have been, you know, our underlying conditions might not actually have been to do with COVID, that somebody in panic might have put a DNR, do not resuscitate on us because we were disposable, because we had underlying conditions. Can you imagine how that feels? And how that must feel for a lot of people who do not have the ability to speak out like we can, and who feel even now that they are being told you are you are disposable, you are not worth being part of our community. Um, and and this kind of it's, a, it's an edging on well it's not edging it's eugenics but that's where we were before, and that's immediately where we went to at the beginning of the pandemic. It kind of opened up. That's the wound that was opened up. We see how easy it is to go there. It's something that, as disabled activists, we've been telling people for years and years, it's just there, it's just there. It opened up, it was just there. If we go back, I mean, as I say, you're, you know, you're all going to be disabled at some point. You know, it may be at the time when you or your children or your, your loved ones are vulnerable. You know, that, that's the danger for me. Um, I don't want to, I did lose a family member who had underlying conditions and was not given a DMR. So, um, yeah. So we don't want to go back. So in light of what we've just talked about, we want to sort of end on a more positive note. So yeah, know, sorry. I'm know. like, oh my god. No. <laughs> sorry. Stuart is very he's he's always calming me down. I'm so sorry. Because yeah. we need to we need to tell these stories, otherwise you know, they're not told. But we, we always try and end on a sort of positive note and um, we don't want it to all become very morbid and very depressing. <laughs> As, as Especially although, not today. Although it can be. Um, in that we all have a knowledge and a power to benefit humanity if people are willing to listen. That's the key point. Yeah. If people are willing to listen, people aren't willing to listen because either they don't know or they're just refusing to listen. Um, it's important that all of us in the room understand that we all, certainly disabled people, bring a value into the education process. We're not burdens on the state, we're not burdens on education, we can all enrich education and accessibility. We like to think that Tim Tambi and I, we do like to think we do make some good in a small way. Um, <laughs> yeah, do, many, yeah, many people yeah, yeah. would see that we are burdens on the state. Yeah. And uh, finally, we would want you all to all try and think about endorsing the social model as a means of making us all aware of the societal barriers that we're all facing. So just to, as a final point for today, we wanted to sort of ask you a little bit more about how we can do this in practice. So this is just a reflection for you guys. Um, in that, because this is why we wanted to stress at the start, people get very fearful when they engage with disabled people or in terms of any access. It's always important prior to any event to ask people what they need. Asking people what they need is not an unhealthy question. People often get very frightened by asking. It's not. The unhealthy thing is not asking at all. Um, rethink why we're making the changes that we are to access. We, and this is something that Tammy and I always come across. When we ask for changes, we're always seen as 
the ones that are asking for the change. So we're always seeing this problem. Nobody seems to think actually, if we make a change for ten people, me, is there other people in the room that can also benefit from that change? Um, it's not because we are just the problem, which is the medical model. And finally, being open to having your existing practices challenged. This is where we were. Um, um, so we always say at the start about being fearful because people don't like to say to stay or do the wrong things. Um, but actually, the beauty of access to inclusion is that it's, it's an ongoing journey. We can always change, we can always develop. Um, we always say that while we are activists, we don't know everything when it comes to access to inclusion. There will be things that we unknowingly perpetuate, that we apologize for. And so if we have caused exclusion for anybody in the room today, we are deeply, deeply apologetic and we will do better going forward. Um, but that's part of our journey. So in order to actually improve your practice, you need to be able to be open to have your practice challenged. That's the key thing that we would want to stress. So at this point, I'm going to draw the session to a close.